Everybody, welcome to the Jimmy Dore Show. Hey, we're going to be in Ventura, California, March 31st. Uh huh. And Tempe, Arizona, May 12th. That's Mother's Day. See you then. We have a special guest with us today. We have a very special guest. His name is Jake Flores. He's a comedian and an activist. He's appeared on Chapo Trap House and hosts his own podcast, Pod Damn America, the best named podcast in the world. He probably considers himself part of the dirtbag left. Please welcome to the show. It's Jake Flores. Hey, Jake, how are you? Hey. Good. I'm good. Uh, it's good, good to be here. So, uh, tell me, how'd you come about the name of your podcast, Pod Damn America? Um, I mean, I think I, uh, I'm very good at coming up with uh, clever names for things, and then uh, them not panning out. And I have a million podcasts that sort of crashed in the dirt. Oh yeah, really? Uh, <laughs> but um, so was this like a response to Pod Save America? Yeah, that's yeah. the joke. I mean, it's it's a mashup of uh, you know their dumb podcast title, and then also the <laughs> famous Reverend Wright speech. God damn America. Oh, God damn America. Yeah, that's our theme song. Not God bless America. <laughs> God damn America. Yeah. How about, uh, so do you ever listen to that Pod Save America? Do you know what they're about? Because we, yeah. we, we did a couple of videos. I had no idea until like recently I saw two clips of the thing. And what was your impression of it? Oh, um, well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I noticed them sort of on the rise a couple years ago when a lot of my uh, sort of more center of the road neoliberal friends were starting to 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 rave about it yeah and that yeah. was immediately suspect to me so i checked it out and a lot of my suspicions were confirmed and uh you know for a long time it was something i would purposely avoid because i don't like feeling angry all the time while listening to something like correct that. but that's it's tough right i know now that the premise of my show which has sort of picked up some traction is basically a dunk on that show every once in a while i have to check in on my podcast dads over at uh <laughs> Over at Crooked Media, yeah, and, uh, Pod you know, see what they're getting wrong that week or whatever they're. It's doing. funny to watch them. We did two videos on them just to watch them do the unbelievable mental gymnastics that they have to do to be to remain corporatists and still try to be cool with the progressives, right? And they, they, what they're just doing is they're sounding like you know Kamala Harris while wearing t-shirts and baseball caps. That's basically what they're doing, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My my favorite thing of theirs was um when AOC got elected because uh oh. you know, she was um <laughs> you know she, she was like her campaign was supported by like the DSA, which I am a member of. Her DSA shirt right now. Oh, okay. Um, which is a thing that, you know, a lot of those types of people are actively against and um as soon as she got elected their message was like this is our candidate. Like yeah. we wanted this, you know. <laughs> and uh and they sort of tried to own her, and it's not a thing that's going to really be sustainable for them because if they you actually understand the ideology, you know, she's a socialist. She's against their politics in a lot of ways. Um, she could be more socialist for my yeah, taste, I, actually. Sure, absolutely. Um, I mean, but I, it's it's amazing all the pushback she gets for being barely socialist. Yeah. Right. I mean, which, what what. Anyway, I think, you know, M Milton Friedman was for a universal basic in income. So this isn't a lefty idea. Sure. Right? So why do you say now I, you have a great story to tell about you had a run in with the Department of Homeland Security. And this is how I first became aware of you. I want you to tell that story. But sure. first, I want to ask you, uh, what what is this dirtbag left about? What is that? <laughs> well, I'm, I, I like to say that I'm the head of the toxic left. Sure, sure. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Um, those probably aren't entirely dissimilar. Uh, the dirtbag left is a term that was coined in an article in The New Yorker. And I oh, believe really? they were covering the podcast Chapo Trap House. Um, so Chapo yeah. Trap House are these people who are... I know um, who they are. Yeah, they're, they're you know, Twitter psychos, but they're, they're also very funny. very funny and very smart, and they have a very, yeah. like, online sense of humor. Well, they're very, you know, and they're not... They're not corporatists. They're not BSers, too. In fact, right. they cut through the bull BS narrative of the corporations, and that's why I like them. I think they're really good. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, one aspect of that that defines, you know, what is now known, it sort of bubbled out, you know, from out of them, and now is probably a, a thing that sort of covers a lot of other podcasts and media outlets and comedians and journalists and things like that. Um, the, the, the through line there, I think the dirtbag part is partially cultural. Uh, at least my take on it as a comedian is that it's it has to do with, um, you know, what's thought of as leftist culture in America. And I think it's important that this thing exists and it's important that we sort of uh, talk about this as comedians because a lot of the, the, the thing that a lot of the things that turn off, um, people who are considering possibly 
indulging in some left of center ideas in America have to do with the scoldy, humorless nature of the liberal <laughs> left, right? Yes. A yes. lot of people I know, I mean, I'm from Texas. I'm from a place where people lump all that stuff together. They right. think leftism, liberalism, all this stuff is, it's the people that are yelling at you on Facebook about, you know, you're uh, this, uh, you know, you're appropriating a thing or you're a toxic masculine person, all this, all the identity politics stuff, right? So I think that the dirtbag left, in a sense, sort of um, not outright like rejects that sort of thinking, but is way smarter about it and isn't actively working against us by uh, weaponizing identity politics in a really cynical way. You know, yeah, it's sort of a, a an offer to people to go. You can support uh, things that are you know really materially good for us, like an economic left solution to things, universal based basic income, Medicare for all, and all these things, and you will not get yelled at by the blogger person who is you know souring everyone on all of this. So, like uh, when you talk about weaponized identity politics, you know, like it's it, like I support transgender rights right now, and I've been educated on that in the last few years, and I, under, I understand that that's a real thing, and that, uh, so I've, uh, but the way the way you can weaponize that is like if you take someone who's very progressive. Uh, and has progressive policies, and then you replace that with someone who's a transgender who actually has less progressive policies. Now you've actually took it, taken a step backwards, and now you're looked like as a bad person because you're going to oppose someone who's a transgender. That's what you mean when you say weaponizing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, because you look like a bad person now because you're going to uh, oppose someone who's uh, in a protected class. Yeah. Uh, but what you're really doing is opposing their policies and it doesn't matter their identity if they have bad policies. Yeah. And I mean, that's essentially what the Democrats are doing right now, at least the, the, you know, the establishment Democrats. Uh, I think, you know, in a lot of ways, they're sort of using um, marginalized identities as a Trojan horse to uh, to sneak in their policies that are actually very like, you know, very destructive towards the massive amount of marginalized people that live in America. Right. Like Barack Obama was a black guy with a Muslim name who got elected and then he did the exact thing, same things George Bush was doing with the tax code, with the wars. He expanded them. He made the banks bigger. He kicked people out of their houses. He was, you know, he he, he was a, a Trojan horse. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like Kamal Harris is a great example of this. He's another great. The neoliberal mind is going to look at Kamal Harris and go, well, this is a woman of color. Right. And, you know justice for her her getting a job somehow drags other people up with her that's not how it works right and the, you know the really obvious thing to a leftist thinker about kamala harris is that she's a cop she's a self-proclaimed <laughs> cop. cop she threw a bunch of people of color in jail so her getting a job helps one woman of color named kamala harris and hurts a lot of other people you know yes. the unnamed people in this equation but i mean that's that's where everyone's brain is broken just that simple concept is something that you know it's just such a cultural like concrete idea in american culture that it's you know it's really hard to deprogram people from this stuff i think yeah uh, i think the real right i think there's lots of certainly uh, issues that you know, speak to identity politics and everything. Um, but, um, you know, when you look at what was wrong with Barack Obama's administration, they had lots of different people of lots of different backgrounds, you know, from different ethnicities and what have you, but they're all from the same class. Exactly. So all from the same, it's like that class, that rich class and Harvard and all that stuff. And, and that's the problem. And, and, and so they, they, you know, Eric Holder was the head of the Justice Department. Did he do anything <laughs> to un racist the justice system in the United States? I mean, what did, I mean, everything they did, they did kicking and screaming, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And the, the you know, they've, they bank on the fact that we have a cultural class blindness in America. Mm -hmm. That's what helps them pull this. You know, pull off the this tr Trojan horse trick. With yeah, the you know the the identity of the politician somehow playing a, a you know a bigger role than the actual policy. Um, yeah, I mean Eric Holder came right from Wall Street. You know, it yeah. didn't matter what his skin color was that much. It mattered more about his class and who he represented and how he thought. And he thought like those people, just like Barack Obama. His whole cabinet came from an email from Citigroup. We all know that now. Yeah, and I think like one of the biggest lessons to learn from Trump winning is that like people are, you know, 
people are not really having this anymore. People kind of know yes. that they're being hoodwinked. Yes. And uh, that the that the that the Democrats and the Republicans are bought by the exact same people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they know people are waking up, which is a big reason why people voted for Trump. We talked to coal miners and and, and minimum wage workers in what in Virginia, and they said, "Hey, we knew that Trump was a, a loudmouth Yankee who should have got his ass kicked a long time ago, but at least he was promising us something." Right. That Hillary Clinton wouldn't even promise us anything. And so at least we gave we're going to try something new. And so they tried. It didn't pan out for them. But they (laughs) that's so what. So what happens? What what happens when you have eight years of Barack Obama doing Mitt Romney policies is you get Donald Trump because people are hurting and they've tried everything. Yeah. And I mean, you know, these aren't necessarily people that are sitting around reading, you know, Marx all day. And I have correct like, you know. Right. But but the reality of. Marxist politics are, you know, the, the end result is you get people that are like, I don't know exactly why, I can't exactly explain, I just have a big blurry image of this thing sucks and this thing's making my life better, and, uh, you know, if, if we don't get the word out about this stuff, then yeah, they, they go towards like a Trump or somebody like that. Right. Um, I think in the next election, I mean, they're probably done with him. Uh, it's probably just going to be a who do you hate least situation. Oh, yeah, and which is kind of, yeah. Right. Right. Exactly. Let me ask you. So the dirt, the term the dirtbag left came from the New York magazine and they were describing the people at Chapo Trap House. I believe that is the origin of the term. Yeah. Okay. And so you just kind of embraced it. Well, I mean, since then, it's just sort of become a like a trope or whatever. Uh, Okay. And I, uh, you know, I I think that they embraced it. And I, um, as a fan of that show, thought about the term a lot. And I thought that that makes sense that. That pinpoints where a lot of me and my friends are coming from politically, I think. So I bet when they say dirtbag left, I bet they mean dirtbag like they're out there, you know, advocating for the poor and people without <laughs> health care, that kind of dirtbag stuff. Right. Yeah. And they want to end the wars and stuff like that. Yeah. That well, kind of dirtbag stuff. <laughs> That's what they mean. Right. Well, I, see, I don't think the piece in The New Yorker was anti uh, us. Um, oh, OK. It was kind of tongue in cheek. Oh, okay. it was sort of a. a pl- oh, they were, they were saying- commenting on how we identify as dirtbags oh, okay, gotcha. on purpose, you know, as kind oh, of an okay. end joke. Um it wasn't like, say, Bernie bro. I also identify as a Bernie bro because it's a dumb thing someone tried yeah. to call me, and now yes. I'll continue the joke by saying I'm me a Bernie too. bro. I have lots of female friends that'll go, hello, I'm a Bernie yes, bro. Yes, me too. Yes, word, that's very funny. Know? Very funny. Yeah. Um, I also embrace the term toxic. I'm toxic left because I don't like corruption in my politics. So that's sure. very, it's very toxic. It's less toxic to actually embrace corruption than it is to actually be against it, apparently to some people. <laughs> so I just, I embrace that because I don't, I don't like corporate cash in, in my politics and, and my, uh, I don't like my politicians ruling in favor of their donors instead of in favor of their voters. So that <laughs> people say that's toxic. Yeah. Well, I mean, so you clearly have the mind of a comedian then because that's what a comedian does. Yes. If any mean thing you say to, to me, I then just turn around and proudly <laughs> yep. describe myself as it. That's right. You know, as they, a way of neutralizing they think it. I, they, they don't get, they don't understand that I have no interest in being in their club. Yeah. In their journalism club, which is a fucking shit club. Yeah. Right. They, 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 they miss right now. This show is doing better journalism on Russiagate and Venezuela than CNN, MSNBC, the Washington post, the New York times and the entire, everybody else who considers themselves independent media, except for maybe three, where do this, a Jagoff comedian in his <laughs> yeah. fucking garage is doing 10 times better coverage than anybody at Mother Jones or fucking NBC News or anybody. If you want to know about Venezuela, don't go to the news media. Even your independent news media is constantly repeating CIA talking points. You know, if you want to go into a country, first you have to set a narrative. And that narrative is whoever's leading that country is a bad guy and a dictator and he presses his party. They say that every time, except the, the media news media, including the lefty news media, falls for it every time. When you repeat that Maduro's a bad guy and there's, he's a dictator, what you're doing is you're cementing. The pretext that the CIA needs you to cement so they can then go into there and launch a coup or an intervention. And people, it's amazing they don't understand. People who consider themselves journalists don't understand that what they're actually doing is being a useful idiot in propaganda for the goddamn military industrial complex. John Bolton and Elliot Abrams and Trump, when you say that stuff about any other country they want to invade, when they first have to set that narrative. And the fact that you consider yourself a journalist and you don't know that shows how shitty you are and why I can do a better job than you can fucking drunk. 
We're announcing our dates for 2019. We're going to Ventura Comedy Club, March 31st, Tempe, Arizona, Austin, Texas, Portland, Chicago, and lots more. Go to jimmydorkcomedy.com for a list of all our dates and live shows. And please become a patron. We give you hours of bonus material. And please make sure you're subscribed. Even if you think you're subscribed, they unsubscribe people every day, and you might be one of them. Check to make sure you're subscribed, and then you have to click the bell twice so they send you a notification when we drop a video. Thanks for your support.